passing through the heavens means he came from wherever God's at, wherever God's throne is at, wherever Jesus was before that. He passed through the heavens. He passed through time and space. He passed through our atmosphere. Some fashion or form to be placed in the various womb. Well, then when he left, he did the reverse of the thing he passed. He passed back through. As the disciples watched him see him in heaven, what did he do? He passed back through the atmosphere, back through time and space, and back into the heavens where God is at. Back to the right hand of the Father where he makes intercession for us. Now, we, we, we know that as, as a pastor that people call us, it's in this message, it's just pray for this situation, pray for this request, and, and I'm glad to do this. That's, I, that's what we're here to do. And, you know, we're, we're here to, to talk to, to listen, to whatever you might need, and I'm able to do it. If I'm able to do it, I'll do it. But I can't do everything. Uh, you read your Sunday school lesson this morning, and, and, and I don't know if it's in the student book or not, but Bruce pointed it out. Sorry, I'm backing up. I'm getting two things confused here. In our stand firm, I was sitting at my table, sort of reading my stand firm for the day, and AJ was sitting next to me, and he pointed out yesterday's. And it talked about this pastor who got pulled over speed. And the, the, the police officer who found out he was a pastor tore the ticket up and told me that I'm not giving you a ticket because you have a direct line to God. You know what? I do have a direct line to God. I do. But so do you as a child of God. You have a direct line to God too. If you've been born again with the grace of God, you have a direct line to the great high priest, Jesus Christ. You don't have to bring a sacrifice. You don't have to bring an offering. You don't have to bring a, a fat calf or anything of that nature in the Old Testament. You don't have to do that anymore. You come directly to Him with what's going on. The writer of Hebrews tells us to hold fast to our confession. What is our confession? First off, our confession is that Jesus is the Son of God. There's no doubt about that. If you remove Jesus as being deity, as being part of the Godhead, and you remove your faith completely, He is the Son of God. God in the flesh. That is our confession. Our confession is also that he came from God, that he came here to deliver us, to rescue us, to save us from our sins. That is our confession. Our confession is also that we put our trust and our faith in this man, this God named Jesus Christ. The God man, the one who created everything. Without him, nothing was made that was made, according to John Christ. Well, that is our confession, as the writer of Hebrews says, has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Now, you go back to chapter 4, verse 1. You see this word, therefore, again. Since the promise that enters rest remains, let us be aware that none of you be found to have fallen short. To be found to be fallen short. The context of understanding in this section of Scripture, the context of understanding why Jesus is necessary to be our high priest under the Old Testament law. As, a, as Jewish people, they would travel yearly and other type, to other festivals as well to Jerusalem where the tabernacle or the temple was later built there, where the Ark of the Covenant where the high priest would be. And they would bring their sacrifices, their offerings to God. And the high priest would take them and offer them to God on the people's behalf in atonement for their sins. Now, we understand that Jesus is our atonement. But still, we, when we sin, notice I said when we, not if I or if you, it, when we sin. We are still in trap in this fleshly body that is susceptible to temptation and yielding to it. It is a constant daily struggle. If you don't, if you don't battle temptation, then man, you're doing something that everybody else seems to find out what's going on. How you're being by not being tempted. Understand, temptation is always there. The, the desire to do things that are wrong is always going to be there. That's why we have to hold on to our confession. Our confession 
is that Jesus is our high priest. That he died for our sins. That we must, as he did, resist sin as well. Verse 1 again, chapter 4. Since the promise to interest rest remains, let us be aware that none of you will be found for the fallen short. The author talks about the Israelites on their journey out of Egypt. And how God gave them everything they needed on this journey. He delivered them from the Egyptians, sent all these plagues upon them, uh, and delivered them. Sent them out, provided man in the desert, provided water for them to do that, and other things. Their shoes didn't even wear out for 40 years. Their clothes didn't wear out for them. God took care of his people. Because you read on. Verse 2. For we have also received the good news just as they did. But the message they heard did not benefit them, since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. For we who have believed into the rest and keep in what he has said. So I swore in my anger they will not enter my race, even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world. What happened? That the entire generation of Israelites that came out of Egypt from 40 years old and upward died in the desert because they rejected God's commands. They rejected His commands. Even while God is riding on the tablets, what are they doing below that? They, they, they coerce Aaron, they're getting up on Aaron, and, and he, he's terrifying himself, and he makes his smoking path. It's golden cat, and they begin to worship it. Then they complain, they moan, they groan. They want to go back to Egypt, but they were slaves at it. God kept giving them opportunities, offer opportunities to trust Him, and they would not. When He got when He when even even then He led them to the promised land. Moses sent twelve men in there. They came back. Joshua and Caleb did a good report. The land is exactly as God said it would be. Let's say. The other ten men said the land is exactly as God said it, but, but, we can't take this land. This land is too big for us. The people in this land are too strong for us. Their cities are huge. Their, their people are tall, and, and we look like grasshoppers to them. We can't do this. Let's just go back to Egypt. That was the final straw for God for those people. He told them, you scattered this thing for 40 days, you're going to run in the desert for 40 years. And they did. Until that whole generation died because they didn't get into the rest of God because they didn't trust Him. We have to hold on to our confession. Our confession is that we have put our faith and trust in God in this life. Because the eternal life that is after this one is the one that really matters. Now don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. This life matters. But if you don't have Jesus, you're wasting your time. You're wasting every day if you do not have Jesus Christ in your life. If you have him, if you have Jesus Christ in your life, you already have eternal life. So this life matters, along with the one we get in heaven, too. we got to hold on to our confession. Secondly, you look at this passage, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus can sympathize with your weakness. You may have any weaknesses? Grandparents, what's your weakness? Grandchildren, right? Okay, great-grandchildren, too. Okay? Those are your weaknesses, right? Many times they are. You're also, lots of times, great grandparents, grandparents, uh, your, your, your body begins to be a weakness. Things you want to do, things you aren't able to do anymore. The fact of life that we have. Understand, though, the context of this, this passage, for we have, do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, our temptations, our struggles, our battles, our fears. Jesus, was he tempted? We know that he was. The devil lay him off into the desert, and he was tempted there for 40 days. Didn't he? Bread and water, and he sat in there. And it wasn't just three times the devil tempted him. He tempted him the entire time he was here on the earth. Even 
even in the garden, Satan was there in the garden. Even though Judas was supposedly possessed by Satan or some powerful demon uh, to lead them off, Satan was on Jesus too. You know, you don't have to do this. You really don't. But Jesus there in the garden is praying, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. But if it is your will, it's going to pass over me, but not my will be done, your will be done. Jesus understands temptation. He understands the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. He understands everything that we go through here. And, and this morning, as I knew we were coming and, and, and what we were speaking about, I'm outside of my driveway and I'm, I'm, I'm talking to Jesus and I'm going, Jesus, were you tempted to do this? Were you tempted to do this? And it's hard for me to acknowledge the fact that he was. Because of what I go through. Because of what you go through. Think about the things you're tempted to do. Jesus understands. He understands. But we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. The one who's been tempted in every way as we are. He understands the pull of sin. He put two people in the garden of Eden where there was no sin, where they had everything perfectly they needed. There was nothing wrong whatsoever there. And still those two people failed. He understands the pull of sin. The power of it. He knows the danger of temptation. But he also knows the pain of yielding to it. And he never yielded to it. You read on in verse 15. Yet without sin. Notice it says he was tempted just like we are in every way. But yet without sin. So when he got angry and overturned the money changers tables to the temple. That's what an anger that we have. If you get angry and punch somebody because you're mad at them. Or, or, or slap somebody. Please don't do that. Okay, don't, don't do that. Punch a hole in the wall. Don't do that. You know, just... That's, that's not the right command. Jesus was a righteous anger in casting out these money changers who were defiling the temple of God, the house of God, where prayer was to be made. He knows the danger. He knows the pain. He saw the pain in his own people's lives. For 40 years, he watched that generation die in the desert. He knows the pain that sin brings. He knows. He was tempted just as we were. Now, the next time you're tempted to do something, Jesus asks him, Jesus, how did you get through this? How did you resist this? Now, now for me, knowing that Jesus is perfect, knowing that he's God, knowing that he's my Savior, my Lord, he died for my sins, to think about him going through the things that I go through in life. Sometimes it's hard to, 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 to grasp and understand. But he did. He did so he can sympathize with us. You ever had anybody, you ever made anybody that's trying to be sympathetic to you and do a very poor job of it? It's a very poor job of being sympathetic. Now, when it, when it comes to certain things, yeah, it's okay to, to tell a kid, get up, and you're okay, you're talking, get up, dust yourself off, and go on. Right? It is. Sometimes, though, we have to go a little deeper. Sometimes when people are dealing with loss, you don't fully know what they're going through. Sometimes when they're dealing with a struggle, you don't fully know what they're going through. Don't just give them the can, uh, the can religious answer. You just need to come to church or things, right? <laughs> just don't sit and be there and that answer. Just don't sit and be there. The better answer is, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? What, how can I pray? Just need to listen. What? I mean, anything you need to do, let me know. That may be a better answer than just telling somebody, hey, you just need to get right to God. <laughs> what kind of secret is that? It's just as simple as what it is. You just need to get right. Well, tell you both, folks, if somebody tells you, you just need to get right, all of every day that you meet, they meet you, would you want to be around that person anymore? Most likely not, right? Most likely not. So often the church wants to judge everybody that's going through a 
a hard time, we forget that we go through hard times. We forget what we struggle with. We forget what breaks our hearts and is breaking the end. And we need to just be right. They don't know how to get right without Jesus, folks. They don't know how to get right without Jesus. I can't get right without Him. That's why I have to introduce them to the great high priest who can sympathize with their struggles. And when I can point them to Jesus who can sympathize with their struggles, then perhaps then I can also sympathize with their struggles. Because he sympathizes with mine. Drug addicts. Sexual deviants. These are real issues that people go through. And you can't just judge men by saying, you just need to get right with God. <laughs> That's not sympathizing with them. You need to love all those people. Pray for them. Introduce them to Jesus because you, me, we cannot get them right. Just looking at a few here, it's not going to get them right. Then maybe Jesus is what will get them right. Me and Jesus is what got me right. And I still make mistakes. But understand this. As James tells me, he's my advocate. He makes intercession for me when I see him. And I can go to him when I make mistakes. When I'm not right. And he helps me through those as well. Because not only does he sympathize with my temptations, he sympathizes with my failures too. Even though Jesus didn't fail, he understands. And, and sometimes I can't comprehend how that works. But it does. He's able to. He made me. He made you. He knows everything about us. He knows what works. He knows what doesn't work. He knows what's going right. He knows what's going wrong. And he sympathizes. He knows everything. He was tempted just like we are. But yet without sin. Then lastly, look at verse 16. Here's where we can find him in the time of need. Verse 16, Therefore let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. In time of need. Again, the Old Testament priest, he would pass in the presence of God. You know he had no this ritual washing. He had to change his clothes. And they put on this ephod, and on the top of it were, were gem stones engraved with the names of the children of Israel, scribes on them. He put on this breastplate and had 12 different stones on it. Each, each one of those stones had a name of the children of Israel on it. And he would go in this holy of holy places, atone for his own sins, and then atone for the people's sins by offering incense and the sacrifice and such and that. So that's he's carrying the weight of the sins of Israel on his shoulders. He goes in there. But he's also carrying them on his heart as he goes in there. Think about Jesus. Think about Jesus who on the cross. Was he not all, were he not all his mind? Were he not all his heart? Was he not bearing our sin load on his shoulders? Yes, he was. He did. He bore all of our sins on his shoulders because we were all his heart and in his mind because he loved us. We now have the ability to approach the high priest ourselves. You don't have to come to me. You can. But you don't have to come to me and let's go together to approach God or me go on your behalf. No, you can go to Jesus yourself. You have a direct access to him. Now, God has opened the ability for us to approach Him. Remember when Jesus died on the cross? The veil of the temple. God supernaturally reached down the standards and just began to rip that curtain from top to bottom. Open up for us, open up for us the way to His presence. And then on the day of Pentecost came, he didn't get even better on the day of Pentecost, did not? On the day of Pentecost, he got better because God's presence, God's love, God's Moved inside of us. 
He moved inside of us on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came down in the form of the Holy Spirit moving in to the hearts of believers. And when I got saved back in 1981, God moved into me. His presence is not some distant place, some far off way, way away from me. He's inside of me. I can approach Him today with anything going on in my life, with my struggles and temptations. When my struggles of quitting, when my struggles of just getting all flustered and mad and upset, I can go to him. When I, all the struggle to go to, seeing those around us hurry, I can go to him. You don't have to go to somebody else. I can. And I do. At times. That's why we're a family. We go to each other to help as well. When we have access to the throne of grace, we can come directly to our great high priest. And notice when we come to our great high priest, we can and we may receive mercy. Mercy will help us in temptation. If you're being tempted to do something you know is wrong, go to Jesus. Call out to him. Call out to him for help. Call out to him for strength. Dig into his word. Do you know that the Lord is Jesus? He and he is the Lord of Lords, the great high priest. Our eternal sacrifice is also the word of God. Go to the word. Go to the source of your strength. Go to the source of your courage. Find out what in his word to help you in those moments of temptation. Back over in chapter 4. In verse number 4 it says, For somewhere... He has spoken about the seventh day in this way. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Again, that passage says, They will never enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter because of disobedience, he again specified a certain day, today. He specified this, speaking through David, that is a long time. Today, if you hear his voice, do not pardon it. Your do not mention Psalm 95. Add that to your homework list to read. Don't harden your heart. When you're tempted, don't harden your heart. When you're walking, when you fall into sin, don't harden your heart. Confess. Remember your confession. Remember who Jesus is that He loves you and He's here to help you. If you're being tempted, don't harden your heart and just walk right blindly into it as the Israelites did. Don't harden your heart. Call out to Jesus. Call out to Him. He will help you. As we struggle in this life with many issues. And let's just, let's just all be honest with ourselves and to each of each other. Each of us oftentimes struggles in, in different areas than someone else. What, what has no effect on me whatsoever can just, just not be completely off of me. What you think for me should have no bearing on me whatsoever cannot be my mind. Because we're all different. We're all in, unique individuals. Satan, our enemy, knows our weaknesses. He knows our weaknesses. He knows what makes us stumble. But so does our God. And I find that in His Word that the one who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. So no matter what you're struggling, no matter what the enemy knows about you, no matter how well the enemy knows you, the Lord knows you. The Lord is stronger than the enemy. But you have to be in those moments of Temptation, those moments of trouble, those moments of trials. You have to decide which one I want to go to. I'm going to fall back into my old ways, fall back in this, this way here, but trust in the Lord. Now, I'm not trying to give you some preaching answer. Some pre I'm trying to give you practical, good application of the Word of God here. Therefore, approach the throne of grace with all of us. Not be afraid. Don't go to God afraid of what he thinks about you. That's what it means. Don't worry about what God thinks about you. And how many times have people not come to God to pray for 
fear of what someone in this place or some other place of worship thinks about me. What they going to think about me if I go pray? It doesn't matter what they think about you. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares if the pastor gets on his knees and prays? What's wrong with me? Who cares? God doesn't care. In just his way. But he does care about you in a loving way. He knows. Don't worry about what he thinks about you. Remember that he loves you. Remember that he cares for you in a way that passes beyond that imagination. Because, because before he <laughs> this amazes me. Before Jesus died on the cross, he knew everything about me. <laughs> Not only did he still die for me, he still made me. Let that sink in. He knew, he knew everything that I would do that would be wrong. He still made me. He made you. What an amazing love. Because he knew that we were one point in time that we've been saved. If you had been saved. He knew also that at one point in time in our lives that the word of God would prick our hearts. And we would be convicted of our sins and drawn to salvation. And we would accept him and be born again in the years. And he also knew that our struggles would one day be over. That our trials would one day be over. Our sadness would one day be over. Our temptations would one day be over. Our brokenness would one day be over. Our failures would one day be over. And we'll be with him free from all this time. Where are you at today? Are you dealing with temptation? If you're dealing with temptation, you can resist it. You can't resist it on your own strength. You can't resist it on your own power. You've got to be. You need help. You've got to go to Jesus. Approach it, come with grace. Approach it. Dig into Him. Trust Him. Hold on to Him. He can help you resist temptation. If you're dealing with brokenness, you're dealing with sadness, if you're dealing with heartaches and loss or whatever. Don't face it alone. Go to Jesus. He's an ever present help. He's always there. Come boldly. Find that mercy. Find that grace and help. In time of need, go to Him. If you're dealing with this whatever situation, loneliness, go to Jesus. You're not alone. He loves you. If you're dealing with decisions, what decisions do we make? What do we do? Where do we go? What should I do here? Don't make that decision on your own. Go to the throne of grace and find help. He's an ever present. He's always there. He's always ready to listen. He's always ready for you to call upon him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. It is amazing beyond our imagination. Today, Father, take your word out. Help us to remind ourselves as believers that we can come to your throne of grace at any moment, any day in our lives. The access is open. Help us, Father, to confess our sins to you, to repent of our sins, to come to you, to find help in times of temptation, to find help in times of sorrow and loss, despair, depression, whatever it may be, Father, help us to come to you with whatever we're going to do and find that mercy and that help and that grace in our time of need. Help your people today, Father, as they call upon you. Send your amazing grace upon them today. Oh, we love you. We love these people. We know you love them anymore. God bless them and watch over them. And we love you and praise you Christ. Amen. If you're lost today and need Jesus, he's here to meet you. He loves you.